Okay, I know. Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our in-house guests, we would ask that last courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And of course, those watching online are always welcome to send questions or comments, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And we will, of course, post today's program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference as well. Leading our discussion is Michael Gonzalez, Senior Fellow in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy. Mr. Gonzalez joined Heritage in 2009. He spent close to 20 years as a journalist, 15 of them reporting from Europe, Asia, and Latin America. He then served in the George W. Bush administration at the Securities and Exchange Commission and later at the State Department's European Bureau. Of significance to our topic today, his last journalism position was as the editor of the Asia Wall Street Journal's editorial page. In his work here, he continues to write on Hong Kong and China, as well as Latin America. Please join me in welcoming Mike Gonzalez. Mike. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I spent uh, a good eight years of my life uh, living in Hong Kong under many different British governors. I, I really have a, a great appreciation for your city. Don't worry, I'm not going to be here too long. I told Minky this morning I was going to make brief remarks. And she emailed me and said, I've seen you be brief before. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, when the State Department issued its, uh, state, uh, its uh, report on human rights last month, it said that um, the most significant issues concerning Hong Kong were a chilling effect on political protest and the exercise of free speech caused by the government's actions, but more importantly, by China's encroachment on this special administrative uh, region. China reacted by telling the world uh, not to, uh, to mind its own business and not be interested in Hong Kong. So I have news for the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party. You know, you don't get to tell us what to be interested in. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to take a keen interest, and our leaders are going to take a keen interest on, uh, on many aspects of, uh, of China and our relationship with China, and Hong Kong will be a part of that. Now, the, the relationship with China is complex. We have uh, North Korea, obviously, something that is happening uh, this week, uh, trade. But, you know, human rights in Hong Kong are also really important. So we're very glad uh, to have today two of uh, the top political leaders in Hong Kong and, and probably the chief advocate of human rights in Hong Kong, outside of Hong Kong. Uh, let me first introduce, we're going to have Alan Leung come in and, and, and give some uh, remarks, and then we're going to, uh, Minky and Alvin are going to back and forth, have a back and forth on Hong Kong. Let me just very briefly tell you, tell you about Alan Leung, who's a very accomplished man. He's the chairman of the Hong Kong Civic Party and one of its founding members. During the 79-day umbrella movement in 2014, he served as a, a convener of the Pan Democrats. And uh, after 12 years as a lawmaker, he retired from the Legislative Council in 2016. He has many, many accomplishments. As I said, he obtained his LLB from the University of Hong Kong and, uh, and, and LLM from the University of Cambridge. And he was uh, admitted as a barrister in Hong Kong in 1983. But the, the most important thing is that he is married and has three children. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that very kind introduction. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is our honor to speak to you at the Heritage Foundation this morning. I trust the harshest critics from Hong Kong are taking full advantage of this live coverage online. As you may know, that Alvin and I have been demonized for bad-mouthing Hong Kong in America. So they must be keeping an eye on every word we say here. But I trust we are well protected at the Heritage Foundation since you are the most welcomed foreign think tank by the Hong Kong government and the local pro-Beijing politicians. After all, you have ranked Hong Kong as the freest economy for the past 28 consecutive years. And I believe we should be free from criticism, at least for the next two hours. 
before I begin my address, perhaps I'll explain a little bit the way that I am attired. I'm wearing a yellow tie. This tie I wore, well, together with two other yellow ties, during the 79 days of Occupy in 2014. Um, I was then, as Michael kindly introduced me, I was then the convener of the pan-democratic camp, meaning democratic legislators serving on the Legislative Council at that time. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were 27 of us at that time. So this explains the yellow color of my tie. Um, to me, it is a color of sunshine, <laughs> hope, positivi pos positivity, and uh, energy. I remember when I was uh, first here in 2007, I started my address by saying, recently I have detected a general loss of interest in Hong Kong. I suppose it is still the case. <laughs> uh, compared to China, Hong Kong has a much smaller population and accounts for much less of the world's GDP if you compare Hong Kong to the mainland. So um, it might be just natural for China watchers to pay attention only to what is happening in the mainland and not in Hong Kong. But I am here to convince you that ignoring Hong Kong is a mistake. Indeed, Hong Kong's significance increases as China rises in prominence and at the historic juncture when President Xi Jinping apparently wants to substitute values and institutions of the China model for those practiced for centuries by the world's liberal democracies. By making sure that Hong Kong remains connected to the world and in ways the same as those obtained during the British colonial era since the 1960s, is not only in Hong Kong's interest, but the world's own. The world cannot understand China without first understanding Hong Kong. And what has been happening here, what China did, is doing, and will do to and in Hong Kong, instruct the world on why and how things are happening, or will happen inside and outside of the country and the course China is likely to take. By ignoring Hong Kong, China watchers cannot watch accurately nor predict with precision. Hong Kong is the only place in China that has been inhabited predominantly by ethnic Chinese and yet practices separation of powers and rule of law with self-disciplined legal professions and an independent judiciary. We use our laws to protect rights and freedoms, including liberties of individuals and freedoms of information, communication, competition, and movements. Our laws keep public powers under check. Hong Kong people hold dear to our hearts universal concepts of an open society, fairness, equality, and the entitlement of creative and diligent individuals to excel. In short, all the core values and in institutions of liberal democracies are not only found here, but have flourished and are sustained in today's Hong Kong. What proof does the world have better than Hong Kong for making the case that the same core values and institutions work for and amongst Chinese people with the pertaining culture and history. Maybe I should uh, give you a brief history of Hong Kong, particularly for those who are watching that uh, do not know or are not familiar with the place. Hong Kong was a British colony from 1842, and on the 1st of July, 1997, over a century of colonial rule ended, 
with sovereignty reverted back to China. Hong Kong people were very concerned about reverting to a sovereign who practices communism with values and institutions diametrically different from those found in Hong Kong. To allay the worries and anxieties of Hong Kong people, China and the United Kingdom executed the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984, which was registered with the United Nations. The Joint Declaration guarantees Hong Kong's way of life will remain unchanged for at least 50 years until 2047. On the 4th of April, 1990, the National People's Congress promulgated Hong Kong's mini-constitution called the Basic Law, which defines in its 160 articles China's policies regarding Hong Kong. Hong Kong has since the 1st of July, 97, become a special administrative region in an unprecedented constitutional setting known as one country, two systems. Hong Kong is guaranteed to enjoy a high degree of autonomy with Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, universal suffrage for electing the chief executive, and all members of the legislature are promised. Article 39 provides for the application to Hong Kong of ICCPR, that, that is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and also the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. By Article 82, the power of final adjudication over matters within Hong Kong's autonomy is vested in our Court of Final Appeal, which may, as required, invite judges from other common law jurisdictions to sit on it. Hong Kong has our own currency, now packed to the US dollar. Our membership of the World Trade Organization is separate from China's and we are a distinct customs territory. Worrying signs have been conspicuous in recent decade, especially since C.Y. Leung took office as the chief executive in the year 2012, that Beijing is not honoring the Sino-British Joint Declaration and promises enshrined in the basic law. I have picked a dozen of the more notable um, instances of the one country, two system model being disturbed and deformed. And I just quickly list them. Uh, and for the reason that I want to keep this speech as short as possible, many of the factual narratives I have actually included in the footnote to the speech that I have prepared for this occasion, and that speech will be available online as soon as I have finished with this address. So do go and check out the footnotes. But here we are. The first one that I name in that dozen of examples would be this. In June 2014, the State Council published a white paper entitled the practice of one country, two systems policy in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Policy in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, so that's the, the uh, title yeah, of that white paper uh, that we usually call it. And by that white paper, Beijing claimed to assert overall jurisdiction over and to perform constitutional duties in Hong Kong. But that is contrary to the high degree of autonomy promised in the one country, two systems model. Number two, resolution of the National People's Congress Standing Committee on 31st August 2014 insisted on a pre-screening by Beijing before any candidate for chief executive can be voted by the people in a secret ballot. Election of all the members of the Legislative Council by universal suffrage promised by Article 68 of the Basic Law was not even mentioned. So in this way, Articles 45 and 68, promising Hong Kong 
with universal suffrage for the chief executive election and all members of the legislature are being observed in the breach. Number three on the list, despite the express terms of Article 22 of the Basic Law prohibiting interference by Beijing with matters within Hong Kong's promised autonomy, instances of such interference have been rampant. Number four, in the name of convenience and for facilitating implementation of the so-called co-location arrangements in the express rail link terminus at the heart of Kowloon, the Standing Committee decided to apply mainland laws, thereby ousting Hong Kong court's jurisdiction within the territorial limits of Hong Kong. Well, insofar as those two floors of the express rail link terminus uh, treated as Chinese territory uh, are concerned. Number five, the notorious booksellers case suggests that liberties of individuals within Hong Kong can be jeopardized and freedoms of publication and information offended. It has made Hong Kong people anxious about our safety even when physically in Hong Kong and are supposed to have been shielded from threats of law enforcement agencies in the mainland system. The supposed protection afforded by the basic law seemed to have been shattered overnight. Number six, repeated interpretations by standing committee of the basic law had the effect of constructing above Hong Kong's court of final appeal an extra tier of adjudication, leaving the courts with little autonomy to interpret the concerned articles using common law principles and jurisprudence. The only consolation, if we may call it that, we have in that is that such a means of intervention has not been used in purely commercial matters, not of a political nature. Number seven, by whipping up the false proposition of there being a Hong Kong independence movement, Beijing avails itself of the excuse to prevent potential eyesores from standing for elections. An out-and-out -out mechanism by which candidates who are otherwise eligible will be vetted for their political stance before voters are able to cast their votes in a secret ballot. In this way, only candidates Beijing does not object will be able to stand in future elections. Number eight, using the same false proposition, Beijing is bringing immense pressure to bear on the Hong Kong administration to enact national security laws required under Article 23 of the Basic Law. This was a mission started by Hong Kong's first chief executive in the name of Tong Chi Hua in 2002, but aborted after more than half a million people took to the streets to protest against it. Uh, that is the year 2003, July 1st. The fears that Hong Kong's rule of law will be tainted by mainland's rule by law, with the resultant danger occasioned to the rights and freedoms Hong Kong has been enjoying, are more real than those existed. 16 years ago in 2002. Yet, Beijing's determination to force the hands of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Administration to accomplish the mission seems stronger than ever. This is worrying. Number nine, while there had been presidents of legislators elect staging protests during their swearing in ceremonies in 2008 and in 2012, the two years of our general elections, six Democratic legislators who had won seats in the most recent general election in 2016 were stripped of their seats for failing to take their oaths sincerely and solemnly. Before the first of such court hearings had been concluded, the Standing Committee issued an interpretation of the basic law to make sure that the court must declare a swearing-in invalid 
and strip the legislators elect of their seats. Number 10. Hong Kong saw the first batch of prisoners of conscience when young people committed to a fairer Hong Kong and holding Beijing to promises made in the basic law were imprisoned when they had intended no violence while acting in civil disobedience. They included personalities that you know in the names of Joshua Wong, Alex Chow, and Nathan Law. The Court of Final Appeal has since corrected errors committed by the prosecuting authorities and the Court of Appeal, but the chilling effect is already here to stay. Number 11, cooperating with Beijing's plans to assert overall jurisdiction over Hong Kong, the Hong Kong administration has become increasingly authoritarian in its approach to govern. Hong Kong has always prided itself as a civilized place where different opinions can be fully ventilated with a view to mutual persuasion. Sadly, people are becoming more concerned about being on the right side of politics than on the right side of reasons. It is worrying to see Hong Kong becoming more polarized and the room for rational debates shrunken. I have come to the last of my list of a dozen. Despite the promise of a firewall between two systems in the one country, two systems model, holes have continuously been drilled on this wall since 1997. The more these holes are, the greater the threat is for Hong Kong to lose our core values, institutions, and ways of life. In short, Beijing now has its finger in almost every pie in Hong Kong. I shall turn next to address the umbrella movement. Beijing's refusal to honor the promise of universal suffrage triggered the umbrella movement and 79 days of Occupy, starting from the 28th of September, 2014. During the 79 days, thoroughfares in the heart of Hong Kong's commercial districts were occupied with people living in tents. Traffic had to be diverted, and what used to be a 15-minute car journey pre-Occupy took at least one and a half hours to complete during it. The scale of the protest shocked the world. The most shocking of all, perhaps, was not the million Hong Kong people who participated in the Occupy, but how peaceful it had been. There were barricades at the borders of the occupied areas and assemblies every night, drawing huge crowd. The peaceful crowd did not smash a single shop window. It was a community consisting of Hong Kong people devoted to the democratic cause. We saw the continued prosperity of the rule of law and a government fully accountable to the people as the ultimate guarantee for our liberties and freedoms. This community displayed such impressive altruism that I admire to this day. Occupiers shared tents, food, and water. University students and teachers were teaching secondary school students at a library constructed in the middle of Queensway. We even implemented and managed an environmental recycling scheme. The occupation zone was also rich with artworks expressing artists' ardent hope for a democratic Hong Kong. It was so utopian, but at the same time, it felt so real because it was real. I happened to be the convener of the Pan-Democrats during the Occupy and had meetings with student leaders, including Joshua, Alex, and Lester Shum, on a daily basis. In such a capacity, I was interviewed by media organizations from all over the world. And American news channels covered Hong Kong during that period on almost a daily basis. Hong Kong was the focus of attention because we were one of the many Davids from around the world who had been confronting the same Goliath. Other Davids were keen to watch how this David named Hong Kong was holding up. They wanted to be part of this peaceful protest by which Hong Kong people, in a euphoric mood, 
stood by our core values and defended institutions of the one country, two systems model promised to us and enshrined in the basic law. They even, I think, uh, might want to be inspired to find their own sling in their encounter with this same Goliath. In his own calculation, Beijing chose not to engage Hong Kong people on this occasion. And the Occupy ended in December after 79 days. Thoroughfares were cleared, occupiers peacefully arrested and removed. But the dialogue that took place between the past and future generations of Hong Kong in every household and Hong Kong at large has better prepared us when we tackle Beijing again on the promised universal suffrage for Hong Kong. The first chapter of the umbrella movement has closed. During the Occupy, Hong Kong people showed self-confidence and renewed our commitment to defending Hong Kong's core values and institutions which are shared universally by all liberal democracies. In a peaceful and dignified way, Hong Kong people demonstrated to the world how David goes high when Goliath goes low. Hong Kong people acted according to our conscience without humbling ourselves or showing Beijing disrespect. Some concluded that the Umbrella Movement was a failure. Quite to the contrary, I say that it has inspired the next generations of leaders of the democratic movement. It has forced Democrats to reposition ourselves as on-the-ground organizers of social movements that address issues close to the hearts of Hong Kong people, and in the process, to empower the people and nurture more organizers of such movements. The Umbrella Movement will be back as its next chapters unfold. It is time I turned to talk briefly about the recent amendments of China's constitution uh, procured by President Xi Jinping. After Mao Zedong's death in 1976, Deng Xiaoping introduced two, uh, three constitutional reforms in China which became his important legacies. First, he demarcated the Chinese Communist Party from the state. Second, he substituted collective rule for strongman politics that revolved around a deified personality. Third, he abolished life tenure for China's chairman. But these reforms were, I think, inspired by the hard lessons Deng had learned during the Cultural Revolution when Chairman Mao's cult of personality brought devastating consequences to the state. The 13th National People's Congress in March amended China's constitution by effectively undoing all the Deng reforms. With these amendments, C can adopt a life tenure Xi Jinping thought became enshrined, and the Chinese Communist Party were embedded into state organs more than before. With Xi at the helm, China tends to become more of an authoritarian state. China's values and institutions are expected to run in directions opposite to those of liberal democracies. Hong Kong in the one country, two systems model will experience more pressure to integrate with the mainland. This seems inevitable because the fate of 7 million is so intertwined with that of the 1.3 billion on the mainland. Hong Kong can hardly be immune to China's developments and authoritarian tendencies. Hong Kong's fate is closely tied to that of China's. Ladies and gentlemen, so what next? What is the way forward for Hong Kong and liberal democracies of the world? Now, I'm glad to report that despite what has happened in Hong Kong, we in Hong Kong have not despaired and are definitely not giving up. 
On the contrary, we see this competition between the mainland system and the Hong Kong system as a good opportunity for values and institutions practiced in the two systems to compete against one another for the good of the people. Those that are more answerable to humanitarian values and able to give people a happier and more fulfilling life must win the competition. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. We in Hong Kong are confident that our values and institutions answer better to natural instincts and inborn aspirations of humankind. As such, and given time, must win this competition with flying colors. Challenge makes perfect. We do expect inst institutions in our system to be improved and perfected in the course of a healthy competition. As Hong Kong has shared the same values and institutions with liberal democracies, we hope we are not alone in this competition. Winning is important not only for ourselves, but the welfare and well-being of humankind. C is trying to tell the world that China is incompatible with democracy. He advocates for a China model, which is in fact an autocracy, with exchange of information heavily censored and individuals closely monitored by the state. He is very good at playing the Chinese exceptionalism card. C appeals to cultural differences and creates a dichotomy of universalist democratic West versus nationalist authoritarian China. Hong Kong comes in here as the single most convincing proof of such a dichotomy being false. Hong Kong has flourished with values and institutions of the universalist democratic East and become a well-respected member of the international community. Through more than a century of multilateral trade, and interactions among civil societies. I remain optimistic that Hong Kong will one day be democratic, and so will the whole of China. I have faith in the Chinese people. <coughs> Despite having C looming large over China, there is still conscience among the Chinese and some of the party cadres. In fact, in our experience in dealing with uh, the CCP, we found that it can be extremely adaptive and accommodating to changes, so long as these changes are necessary for the CCP to keep a firm grip on power and remain the ruling party. The CCP can be very unorthodox in its ideology. Its guiding thought shifts from time to time and often capable of taking on board elements that are in conflict with his original Maoist rhetoric. For example, in the year 2000, the then party secretary, Jiang Zemin, proposed the important thought of the three represents, a guiding socio-political theory that allowed CCP to admit capitalists, entrepreneurs, and advocates of free trade as its members. This was unimaginable in Mao's times. The following year, in 2001, China joined the WTO, taking the first steps to integrate itself into the global economy. Some might criticize the CCP for such inconsistencies, but we actually think it is a good thing because that means it is ultimately changeable. Closer at home in Hong Kong, two chief executives and the, uh, in the names of C.H. Tong and C.Y. Leung stepped down when they would definitely have stayed on had the CCP been able to have things its way. These anecdotes show that the CCP is not as unyielding as it appears or wants the world to believe it is. Deng's legacy of reforms and progress of opening up are so extensive that it has become almost impossible, I would argue, for China to retract from them. 
It is in no one's interest for these reforms to be reversed. Xi's constitutional changes might look frightening at first sight, but time must prove that such reversal of progress serves China no good in the long run. Backlash sparked by those changes coming from both China's own elites and the international community are beginning to be felt. Such backlash might just explain why President Xi, in recent interviews, said he was personally opposed to lifelong rule and adding, and I quote, that foreign observers have misinterpreted the recent constitutional amendment that revoked the two-term limit on his presidency. It would therefore not be pre preposterous to suggest that Xi's backtracking from Deng's reforms might just not last no long enough to inflict irre irreversible damage to those reforms. The same is it for Hong Kong's one country, two systems model. Hong Kong's strength lies in its being the only true international financial center servicing China. As such, Hong Kong cannot be replicated and its role mightily important for everyone, especially China. Beijing knows it. It will be in China's interest to keep Hong Kong the way it is. Beijing ought to come around to its senses and stop meddling in affairs within Hong Kong's promised autonomy. If the line between the two systems are further blurred by Beijing forcing Hong Kong to adopt all of mainland's values, institutions, and way of doing things, it will be difficult for Beijing to justify to liberal democracies that Hong Kong remains a separate customs territory and should continue to be accorded the status of a WTO member in our own right. If Hong Kong's rule of law dies, our status as an international financial center must perish with it. It will not be in mainland's interest or to its advantage for Hong Kong to become just another mainland city. Therefore, I see no reason why China would want to further undermine Hong Kong's institutions, including in particular the rule of law and freedom of information. It is important for China to integrate deeper into the world's economy. I see WTO to be the club of nations that sets the ground rules for international trade. Joining WTO on 11 December 2001, China manifested its intentions to abide by the sorts of economic liberties of the club and signed bilateral and multilateral agreements with WTO member states. We understand America has concerns about China's possible failure to honor obligations of its WTO membership and breaches of agreements signed between American and Chinese corporations. If America has evidence that China fouled the WTO rules, or breached signed agreements, it should have resort to WTO's institution for dispute resolution or file lawsuits against Chinese entities for breach of agreements, as the case may be. By foregoing the rules-based means to address such issues and taking the law into its own hands, America shows disrespect for WTO and the rule of law. This is the last thing America wants to do, particularly when you are the leader of the world's liberal democracies and want China to respect the same rules-based order for international trade. Unless President Trump is serious about American exceptionalism and wants to fill the sea dichotomy of universalist democratic West versus nationalist authoritarian China, we venture to suggest that an all-out so-called trade war waged against China may not be wise. When America, the strongest member of WTO, seeks remedies outside the dispute resolution mechanism of the club, why should those weaker members stay in the club when they are or feel being consistently bullied? We cannot leave this platform without registering for Hong Kong our strongest protests against America levying prohibitive tariff on steel and aluminum exports from Hong Kong. 
America enjoys a big trade surplus in its bilateral trade with Hong Kong. Besides, Hong Kong has always been the voice of free trade and a vanguard of multilateral trade. Levying such prohibitive tariff on Hong Kong is unreasonable and certainly cannot be justified within the WTO framework. Applying economic sanctions to Hong Kong will hurt its leading position as the only international financial and trading center in China. And ladies and gentlemen, you heard my argument that perhaps by staying as an international financial center may be our only leverage against the mainland for keeping our own values and institutions which are shared with other liberal democracies. America needs no reminder of Hong Kong's importance as a showcase of values and institutions practiced by liberal democracies with success amongst ethnic Chinese in a place of Chinese culture. The more Hong Kong is criticized for its embrace of the rule of law, free trade, fair competition, freedoms, and individuals' liberties, the more are we entitled to encouragement from America. The more important defender, that, I mean the most important defender of the same values and institutions, and not to be trampled upon by it. The suggestion of a prohibitive levy on Hong Kong's export is just disappointing. We are seeing the State Department, United States Trade Representative, and the Department of Commerce, as well as congressmen and relevant NGOs on this trip, and shall be making these same points. It is true that Hong Kong has in recent years been under pressure to yield to the mainland system, but we are continuing with our well-spirited defense of our values and institutions according to the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. Hong Kong treasures its status as a member of WTO in its own right and a separate tariff region and customs territory from the mainland. Hong Kong can be trusted to abide by WTO rules, regulations, and decisions, irrespective of whether the same accord with Beijing's wishes. It cannot be emphasized more that Hong Kong remains a different system in the one country, two systems model, and it will be in everybody's interest for Hong Kong to remain so. And I hasten to add that this is supported by the latest Hong Kong Policy Act report done on Hong Kong that uh, you published only recently. President Clinton, the president at the time of China's accession to WTO, said in a speech in March 2000, I quote, by joining WTO, China is not simply agreeing to import more of our products. It is agreeing to import one of the democracy's most cherished values, economic freedom. End quote. It certainly is too early, I would argue, to conclude that Clinton must be wrong. The Communist Party and C may be taking time to figure out how values and institutions of liberal democracies may work fairly for China uh, as it is integrating deeper into the world economy. It is really up to uh, other member states to show China how it is to everybody's advantage for WTO to work and to convince China that the rules of the club are capable of providing a fair playing field. It would be best if America would continue to be a positive influence on China by working collaboratively on fair dealings and reciprocal treatments in business rather than building up more barriers to trade by waging a trade war. War is not to be declared lightly. Particularly when America cannot be sure about a decisive win without, de without dealing severe blows to its own economy. China has 1.3 billion people in support of a domestic market economy. Beijing has effectively prevented renminbi from leaving the country. And the level of national debts still allows China to borrow for more of a while. As America raises tariffs, China will find trade partners unreliable and increasingly distrust international trade. This can result in China recoiling to its shell 
with Xi becoming more of a nationalist authoritarian leader. A trade war would only drive China further away from universal values such as democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. As a staunch supporter for free trade, I am convinced that only peaceful and open engagement with China can lead to democracy. It takes time to convert China. We must be confident that our values and institutions can withstand the severest of challenges. If the cards are played right, Clinton's wish may just be granted, and that will be for the good of the humankind. Now, I come to the end of my address, um, and I, I'm grateful to many Americans who I come across, both on this trip and on other trips that I made uh, to your country. And the question always asked of me is, what can America do for Hong Kong? I appreciated uh, your eagerness to help and could only hope that you would not be too disappointed when I invariably responded by saying this, there is not much you can do directly to help our democratic cause. Keep a keen interest on what happens in Hong Kong and to speak up whenever you see something wrong. Allow me to repeat that to the audience today. Recently, I have observed that there are calls for the revival of the bipartisan China-Hong Kong caucus in Congress. I think it is a great idea, for it raises awareness on Hong Kong and China issues. But even if it does not become reality, these calls at least show that Hong Kong is back on your map, which I am extremely happy about. And constant and regular monitoring of the implementation in Hong Kong of one country, two systems policy within the framework of your United States Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992 is also something that is justified. Revival of the annual report since 2015 is a useful means of uh, calibrating Hong Kong's uniqueness to instruct on the continued operation of that act. International diplomacy is largely dictated by any one country's own national interests, and that is just understandable. Democracy in Hong Kong must be achieved by Hong Kong people ourselves. It is not for me to ask you to fight our cause. Living in truth, a phrase associated with and is the hallmark of a Clef Havel, is what we are striving to do in Hong Kong every day. When mouthpieces of Beijing say the Chinese constitution applies to Hong Kong as much as to any cities in the mainland, we retaliate by reminding Beijing that it had signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984 and promulgated the basic law in the year 1990, in, in, uh, in, in uh, April 1990. And Beijing has to abide by these documents and to subject its otherwise omnipotent powers to them. When such mouthpieces say it is right for the administration to vet candidates for their political stance before allowing their name to go on to the ballot paper, we retaliate by referring to the ICCPR and what universal suffrage entails. Such examples are too numerous, numerous to list exhaustively here, given the time constraint. It suffices for me to say that uh, when we are refuting lies about things that Americans hold dear to your hearts and have experience about, please speak up and join us in such retaliation. You are doing it not only for Hong Kong, but for the protection of American stake you have over there. Besides, it would be good to organize uh, I suppose, more programs promoting exchanges between civil societies of America and Hong Kong. Whenever American officials and politicians are visiting Beijing, make a day tour to Hong Kong and ask to see the Civic Party. Well, of course, and others in the democratic camp. Help Hong Kong to maintain our ties 
with liberal democracies of the world and maintain our integration into the world economy. So long as Hong Kong remains indispensable to China as its only international financial center, and provided America and other members of WTO keep China within the club and resolve differences amongst them by making use of the club's apparatus, I am confident that the values and institutions shared by Hong Kong with liberal democracies will withstand the test of time and continue to flourish. Meanwhile, Hong Kong will continue the fight for democracy. You can rest assured that despite hurdles the Communist Party has erected in front of us, and notwithstanding frustrations and setbacks, we in Hong Kong do not despair and are not giving up. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for tr a truly remarkable address. I just tell you, are we going to do this? Uh, I'm going to now introduce our other panelists. We will have a discussion for about 10 minutes or 10 or 15 minutes, and then I know there's, I recognize many experts. Uh, you know, we have some questions here. I know that uh, the founder of the Heritage Foundation, Ed, Edward J. Fulmer, has just joined us, a man who knows Asia very, very, very well. Uh, so let me just introduce our panelists. Uh, Alvin Young is a leader of the Civic Party. Since uh, 2011, Alvin has been uh, representing the Civic Party in multiple elections. He represents uh, the New Territories East, and uh, he received over 160,000 uh, votes uh, at the last election. Minky Worden is the Human Rights Watch uh, Director for Global Initiatives. Uh, she uh, pre, uh, she really a, a very a, a true human rights campaign. Her. Uh, when I when I asked her about three weeks ago if she could join us, she said, "Well, if I'm not in Russia, I'll, I'll go and 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 be with you." Uh, I first met her when I was a wire service reporter in Asia about 30 years ago. She was about 15, I think. I was in the late 20s. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me just uh, fire off a question uh, right away to to you. I mean, we should be done maybe in about 11, 15, 11, 20, 11, 25, depending on the, what the timing that you in the audience have. Um, what, this is the United States, so I want to bring it back to something Alan touched on a lot, what we can do. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I was, when I was covering China and Asia in the 80s and 90s, I, I too hoped what Clinton hoped, that you know, economic freedom was going to bring, bring in political freedom. Uh, I have to say, disappointingly, this, this has not happened in China the way I thought it was going to happen, one of the many mistakes I've made. Uh, uh, so I, what, let me ask you, uh, Minky, first, and then uh, Alvin, if you want to join what can the U.S. do right now? What are we doing now, right now, uh, in this area, especially with regards to, to the freedom? We have a, a city of 8 million people, larger than many European countries, aspiring to, to liberal democracy and a sovereign that is violating an international treaty and in, in, in really encroaching on those uh, freedoms. What can we do? What, what are we doing? Uh, thank you, Mike, and, and thank you to the Heritage Foundation for always helping to keep the spotlight on Hong Kong. Um, I, I'd like to also especially thank our friends from Hong Kong for, for coming to, to speak about the situation uh, and to say that uh, July 1 will, mar will mark 21 years since the handover from Britain to China. And I think it's important to start with the positive. And the positive is that today um, uh, Hong Kong is still the freest part of China. It has press freedom. It has the rule of law. It has religious freedom. Companies want to base their operations there because of the rule of law. News organizations are able to have regional bureaus and tell us important things that are happening about China. Human rights defenders can do their work from Hong Kong. Its importance is very much outsized to its actual size. Um, Hong Kong is as free today as it is not because of the Chinese government. Uh, the Chinese government has systematically made efforts over the years to threaten and repress and to renege on an international treaty. Hong Kong is as free as it is today because of courageous Hong Kong people. We have uh, leaders with us here in Washington from the Civic Party. There are uh, lawyers, there are doctors, there are journalists, and there are advocates for religious freedom who are on the front lines every day. And they're the ones we have to thank for why Hong Kong is as free as it is. I share, I share um, Mr. Leung and Mr. Young's 
uh, uh, optimism about the future of Hong Kong, chiefly because of leaders uh, like we have here today and also the youth movement. Uh, the next generation, in, for me, I lived and worked in Hong Kong before, during, and after the handover. The most surprising and interesting thing to me has been that the generation that was not even born at the time of the handover has uh, has fully embrace the core values of Hong Kong. They understand what makes Hong Kong different from China and that it is something worth fighting for. To your question, Mike, about what the U.S. can do, uh, at the beginning of your introduction, you said that China is complex and the U.S.-China relationship is complex. That is 100% correct. But I would put to you that Hong Kong is simple. Hong Kong is guided by the U.S.-Hong Kong Policy Act. It is guided by uh, the Joint Declaration, a 1984 treaty that is registered at the United Nations. And as Mr. Lerung has said, it is it guarantees that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights continues to apply to Hong Kong. So that means that the U.S. and every member of the international community is well within their rights and indeed have an obligation to insist that China uphold its solemn international pro promises. Um, one question that often comes is, gosh, the British government was the colonial ruler what, isn't this their responsibility? What does it really have to do with the United States? Um, and unfortunately, I think it's fair to say the British government has dropped the ball. They have uh, thrown Hong Kong under the bus, really, sorry for the double metaphors. Uh, they've thrown Hong Kong under the bus for trade with China. Um, uh, and I think that's a shame because it discounts the incredible achievement of Hong Kong in maintaining the rule of law that is so critical for business with China. Um, so I think the short-sighted approach of the British government means that the U.S. must step up. And to what specifically the U.S. can do, I want to say that the U.S. Congress has been very good consistently for decades, both Republicans and Democrats, in defending Hong Kong democracy and freedoms. Uh, the problem generally has always been at the State Department. And I uh, look constantly for any sign that the Hong Kong State Department is going to react to any of the negative developments that you have just outlined for us in such a crisp form. Um, so I would say the main thing the U.S. State Department could do is find its voice through the U.S. Consul General in Hong Kong, who is uh, taxpayer-supported to, uh, to state perfectly obvious things about the U.S. interest in, in preserving the rule of law in Hong Kong. It's in the U.S. national interest, and it's actually his job. You see, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Heritage, for having Alan and I here to speak to you directly. Um, it, it could take forever to talk about what can you do for Hong Kong, but the long and short of it is basically illustrated clearly in Alan's speech, that is, do not forget about us, and f what exactly can you do? Well, now with the trade war looming, and as Alan make it very, very clear, if you do not want Hong Kong to be seen by international community as part of China in in the way that you do not want it to, to you do not want it to happen, and if you do not want international community to treat Hong Kong as any other ordinary Chinese city, then please convince the administration to grant Hong Kong an exemption under the two three two section two three two. That is of utmost importance for simple reason. If you think China has done all these wrongs on trade and in Hong Kong, then why should you penalize the victim? We have been doing everything we can to uphold our trade obligations. We have a functioning law enforcement agencies in protecting IP rights. We have a functioning and, in fact, a world-class judiciary. We have done everything we can as a player on international trade. So why should we be penalized? And in fact, if you can grant us that exemption, that is to recognize that Hong Kong is not an ordinary city of China. That is to recognize that one country, two systems is there. And in fact, Hong Kong is treated uniquely under the Hong Kong Policy Act 
1992. So may I please advise everyone here to convince your administration that Hong Kong deserves an exemption in that regard? Uh, let me press further. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, Alvin, I'll start with you, Alvin. <clears throat> you know, President Trump is not the first American leader to, to say America first. I mean, every, every president, all his 44 predecessors, hopefully thought of American interests first in the conduct of foreign policy. Uh, can you recast how it is in America's interest to help Hong Kong and, and how, you know, for Hong Kong to remain free, independent, and, and really have all the privileges that the Joint Declaration promised Hong Kong it would have? And Minky, you come as well, if you want to comment out. Perhaps I should restate the fact that America enjoys a great surplus from trading with Hong Kong over the past years. Uh, there's a vast interest uh, from American companies in Hong Kong. And if Hong Kong is to lose its status as the one true international financial center in China, then what will, do, what will it benefit uh, America? I'm afraid that would, it will only harm your interest and of course our interest. So, um, and one more thing, that is, never forget that there are people fighting for the same values that we all share in Hong Kong. And if we are treated just the same as you treat China, then that is the biggest discouragement to us on the ground fighting for our values. As I mentioned, and if I may just repeat the same line, that is, please do not penalize us as is, as if you see that, that China has been doing all these wrongdoings on Hong Kong, then we, if, there's no way you should penalize the victim. So um, I, I have to stress it again because I think that is very important. Thank you. Alan, you want to add anything? Well, as I said in my uh, address, uh, international diplomacy is always uh, dictated by national interests. So I wouldn't be surprised that your... Uh, presidents uh, kept on saying America first. But the thing is, it uh, helps not only Hong Kong by your speaking up when you see something wrong uh, happening there. It, in fact, directly helps you to uh, protect your stake in Hong Kong. And more importantly and more macroly, uh, we, we, we all see that President Xi is now... Uh, feeling so good about the China model that he wants values and institutions of the China model to take the place of those in uh, those values and institutions of uh, liberal democracies. So if Hong Kong can defend these democracies, I mean these uh, values and institutions of, of liberal democracies, it would mean a lot uh, in this uh, uh, competition if I may put it that way, between the, the two models. So I think that, that speaks loads for America uh, up, trying to help Hong Kong uh, to uphold the same values and institutions. Thank you, Mickey. Yeah, I, I, I would like to respectfully disagree with one part of your speech, uh, Mr. Leung, sure. and that is where you said that the U.S. can't do much. Um, and I'm going to push back on that, and I think it's the correct approach. And, and let me explain why, and also what is at stake. And what is at stake is really, we all know the, very, the great differences between Hong Kong and China. Um, you know, China has a constitution that protects human rights, it protects press freedom. Mm. It, it's a wonderful document to read it. But, uh, <laughs> but we all know that it's not upheld. And Hong Kong people have been tenaciously defending the rights and freedoms uh, that they have, that is the, the identity, the core value of Hong Kong. Um, but the U.S. also has a strong interest in defending Hong Kong. It, uh, every objective that the U.S. has in foreign policy with China will be better achieved by preserving and defending the rights and freedoms in Hong Kong. So whatever it is that the U.S. would like to see, and let's just take, for example, intellectual property um, or uh, the rule of law, the, you know, China is the place where a Nobel Peace Prize laureate died in state custody last year. Hong Kong is the only place 
in China where his death could be mourned. I think it's a very important distinction, and it's one that the U.S. does have an interest in. Uh, it has an interest and it has a structure for having a policy. So I think the most important message that people can hear is um, understand what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, it's really negative trends, I think, across every measurable human rights area. And since I'm here as the human rights person, um, you have gone through these areas. But, but let me actually just be clear that um, all of the areas where the U.S. has an interest are in a decline in Hong Kong. Um, there are pressures on journalists. There are pressures on religious leaders, enormous pressures on academics and academic freedom. Um, the democracy youth movement, um, there are, I never thought I would say this, there, are there have been political prisoners in Hong Kong. And they are, they are, um, uh, they are young people with hopes and aspirations, not for independence, but that Hong Kong should remain the free society that they were promised. So I think um, the U.S. has a manifest interest in um, uh, helping to keep the spotlight on Hong Kong, in helping to draw a line and say, this is an international treaty, we need you to respect it. Um, and I think because we have laws and policies over a period of decades, uh, if we're, if you are, if the U.S. has a strong and consistent policy, and I think consistency is very important, if it has a strong and consistent policy, then over time you're going to get less pushback. If at any point the U.S. or frankly any other government, uh, see the United Kingdom, signals that they are prepared to roll over and accept these encroachments on human rights and the rule of law, then you can expect more pressure. You won't get less pressure for rolling over or shutting up. You will get more pressure because the Chinese government will see an opening and they will attempt to bulldoze you. So I think the it's very important that the policy uh, to defend Hong Kong human rights, rule of law, and democratic aspirations is um, consistent across time and across administrations. Thank you, and uh, I'd like to now open it to the audience. The only thing I ask is that you uh, introduce yourself, say which organization you represent. You can make a statement. It'd be better if you frame it in form of a question. Just be brief. Uh, right here, this young man. Hi there, David and Sarah with the Heritage Foundation. Um, you mentioned one of the ways that we could help um, Hong Kong is by uh, you know, engaging with them and uh, drawing them into um, you know, our drawing them into other Western uh, and liberal democracies. Um, and one of the ways I think we might be able to do that, and an idea we've sort of floated is by allowing Hong Kong to join the visa waiver program. Um, obviously, other countries that are liberal democracies and have, you know, we engage with healthy amounts of trade and tourism with, we allow them to come to the United States without a visa. Based on some of the difficulties with China, that is currently not, the, we, do, we do not allow that. Um, what would you think about a, an idea in which we would allow people from Hong Kong to visit the United States without a visa, um, but also make it contingent on the State Department assessing that autonomy that is so important, saying we're going to give this benefit to the people of Hong Kong so long as they maintain that autonomy that they were promised? Thank you, David. Well, thank you, David. Uh, I, as I already uh, alluded to, uh, the good thing that can be done by promoting uh, exchanges between the two civil societies. So your proposal is certainly welcome. And the condition that you put on uh, allowing Hong Kong people to travel here without a visa is also fair enough because uh, you accord to Hong Kong some different treatment that can only be justified on uh, Hong Kong being uniquely different from the rest of uh, China. And um, so a sort of calibration uh, and assessment or surveillance from time to time, or if you like, some uh, uh, performance indicators <laughs> as to how good Hong Kong is still keeping up with those differences is only fair. Um, so yes, those are my immediate responses. Anybody else? Yes, Minky. 
I also that I think it's a terrific idea, and it also uh, um, reminds us that one of the most perfidious things the British government did is when they were planning to ha hand Hong Kong back to China, they actually stripped Hong Kong people of the British citizenship they were born with. So uh, many Hong Kong people were born as British as Theresa May and uh, had that citizenship taken away from them. Hong Kong people, uh, uh, I think it would be an absolutely appropriate recognition of how different Hong Kong is from China, and it would also signal support for Hong Kong people. And make no mistake, they don't want to immigrate here, by and large. They want to visit here, they want to do business here, and they want to come and remind, a, uh, remind the United States um, that our values should include supporting Hong Kong people. A very short note, that is, that is the biggest encouragement to Hong Kong people if a, a visa-free policy can be implemented. And we fully respect that United States is a sovereign state, of course, and you have your own uh, policy on uh, uh, having visitors. And if you impose any conditions, as Alan said, that is a fair uh, condition, then of course, it's up to the Hong Kong government to keep up to that condition and to demonstrate that we deserve this policy to be continued. So um, I'm 100% positive in what you have just suggested, David. Okay, uh, uh, right here in the front, and then we'll go to you. Hi, uh, my name is Alex O'Connor, and I'm from the uh, Office of Marco Rubio. So uh, should the United States decide to raise tariffs uh, are there any policies that Hong Kong has in place that would prevent the Chinese from just using Hong Kong as a, a proxy to get away from those tariffs? And additionally, do you, I know it's kind of far in the future, but do you have any idea about what happens when the joint declaration expires? And like, do you have any sense of how, you know, just, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um, first of all, Hong Kong uh, has still in place uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, and we have a free press to see to uh, Hong Kong not being used in your description as a proxy uh, by the mainland to uh, avoid uh, tariffs and, uh, and taxes. So uh, notwithstanding the pressure being brought to bear on Hong Kong, I think Hong Kong is still faring up quite well in that regard. Uh, as I also reminded the audience here, that uh, the latest um, Hong Kong Policy Act report, I think out only recently to cover the year 2017, uh, also came to that conclusion. So that is that. And the uh, second part of uh, your question, uh, sorry, what was that? I forgot. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's uh, 2047. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Joshua Wong, uh, who you must know, uh, even if not personally, you have heard about his name. Uh, Joshua, uh, he is only 21 years old. Huh? Uh, and he is uh, telling us that by 2047, he would be in, only in his mid-40s. And he is entitled to have a say in what Hong Kong will become by 2047. And I agree with him that, in fact, in the first uh, round of talks between the British and the Chinese, uh, Hong Kong people were left completely out of those negotiations. So I think uh, it is only right for Hong Kong people to be heard as to what would happen to Hong Kong and Hong Kong's fate uh, come 2047. Perhaps I could add it. Um, we have to accept the fact that Hong Kong is a free port and there must be some capitals abusing the fact that of that status. But we have to confess that is the fact. However, I have to reassure you that most of the entrepreneurs in Hong Kong are genuine. And uh, with, as Alan said, we have a very, um, very good press over there. Everything is transparent with uh, very uh, efficient law en enforcement agencies. And we are complying with all these international regulations as recognized by the international community and all these investors around the world. I trust 
the system, the checks are there functioning. And so um, that's my uh, response to your first question. If I might uh, uh, answer the question on uh, 2047, when I will be 81 years old, <laughs> Um, uh, but Joshua, I think, will only be 51 years old or 50. Not in his 40s. Yeah, not in his 40s, if my math is correct. Um, but but I think I, I um, Heritage has hosted uh, Mr. Wong and colleagues before here, and I and I you've heard from him. But I think the animating uh, one of their um, animating concerns is that they will be that that they will be alive. This is not a distant thing for them, and their generation are the ones who who uh, will have to carry forward this fight. Um, I, I think it's. Uh, 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 reasonable to hope that they will actually win, ultimately. They wouldn't be doing this if they didn't think they were. But I do think it also goes to the Chinese government's current mishandling of Hong Kong um, and the abandonment of Deng Xiaoping's one country, two systems model would be a catastrophe for Hong Kong. So the um, disqualification of elected leaders, Agnes Chow, um, Alex Chow and others, the is sends a very bad signal. If um, if it's supposed to be Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy, yeah, and young people stand for elections and are elected, they should not be disqualified on a bogus basis. That sends a message to the young generation that it's actually very much against Beijing's interests because then that will send them into the streets. And that's a recipe for disaster. So I think it's uh, um, the message needs to be sent and received in China that if you uh, disqualify, jail, and alienate this young generation who are looking at the year 2047 and saying, hey, that's pretty close to me. That's only three decades away. If you alienate them, you are setting yourself up to, for a downward spiral of the relationship. And I think we, uh, we're four years out now from the umbrella movement. And I think it is a useful time to take stock about how, ch how China caused that situation to escalate by mishandling it. Remember that the movement got its name because the peaceful demonstrators were holding umbrellas against tear gas. That was an epic mismanagement that escalated the uh, that escalated the movement, and so I think uh, it does require a rethink from Beijing. Um, uh, as uh, as uh, Alan Leung says, they've certainly shown themselves to be pragmatic enough to uh, correct course. So that's a message that the U.S. needs to send: is stop creating political. Pre prisoners in Hong Kong, stop alienating this young generation and work with them to build a, a Hong Kong that is uh, a, um, a strong and vibrant part of China in 2047. Thank you. There's a question right here. Roger Ream with the Fund for American Studies. This is perhaps somewhat of a follow-up. Uh, you didn't touch on concerns or threats in Hong Kong coming through the educational system. And I wonder if much has happened in terms of either curriculum, K through 12 education, or threats to academic freedom, uh, self-censorship at universities by professors. Uh, could you comment on that? Uh, well, uh, in fact, uh, it is in, in one of my footnotes uh, <laughs> that I did not read out. Uh, of course, uh, such threats are there uh, particularly starting from the appointment of Johannes Chan, Professor Johannes Chan, as a uh, pro-vice-chancellor of Hong Kong U. Uh, and the recent uh, saga uh, of uh, Benny, Professor Benny Tai uh, asking people to contemplate what would happen uh, if uh, uh, the... the uh, sovereignty or the Communist Party uh, rule ended in Hong Kong, that sort of uh, scenario. Uh, I think the, the um, Communist Party and the Hong Kong SAR government came out in, uh, uh, in great uh, 
forces against Professor Tai, uh, and and also uh, generally we we see in Hong Kong self censorship being practiced by the media and all that. Uh, so these things are with us, but uh, as I described, we are continuing with the well spirited defense of the scope of academic freedom, of freedom of uh, uh, the press, etc. Uh, and that is how, uh, or the, the or that that is how American voices can come in uh, to speak up for those values. And that that will uh, not as as uh, Miss Warden just put it. That is that American voice is important, um, uh, and you are not just there uh, helping only Hong Kong, but you are defending your stakes over there. Uh, and you are affirming uh, in this competition between the China model and the model of liberal democracies, uh, and you are you are actually helping to defend uh, the systems that uh, we share with you. Uh, perhaps I could also contribute. Sure, but let me ask you: the, the one of the sparks for the umbrella movement was that they wanted to change the the curriculum, right, in the schools. The patriotic education. That was land. that took place in two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's exactly yeah. what I was trying to say. Uh, in two thousand twelve, when the then chief executive C. Y. Leung took office, he introduced a patriotic education uh, uh, curriculum, uh, tried to impose on secondary student uh, secondary school students. And that's how we, uh, Joshua, in fact, that's how he made his name uh, back then as a, a teenager in the age of around 15, uh, together with his uh, peers. I'm very confident in the young students, the parents, and of course, the people in general. Um, we had a mini Occupy movement back then, uh, which occupied the square in front of the government headquarters and, in fact, uh, the, the street next to it for a week, I remember, yeah, uh, right. about that. Leading Be to the umbrella yeah, movement. We, before school starts in September that year. So that's how we demonstrated how when we are, not, when we are having strong concerns of curriculums, uh, of course, the government is doing a much smarter job, quote unquote, uh, in recent years. They try not to tell you that we are imposing this on you, but we have smart parents um, with, uh, with the help of social media. Uh, people would you know, look at the, the curriculums and put online and so we can get a support from around Hong Kong so we can push the government to respond uh, on whether they are trying to do this or that. So um, I truly understand that this is how the other side, namely the government and the probation camp is trying to do, that is to impose their values on us. Yet, uh, I am also very confident in our people. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to add that the patriotic education campaign was, or the, the program, was a pretty good example of complete backfiring of a, of a repressive policy. So the, the idea that you would have a, that you would uh, brainwash children in Hong Kong, that you would, um, uh, that they should not know the reality of uh, China's recent history, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, I think that was, that was uh, deeply flawed. Uh, effort. And as I said before, whenever the Chinese government or whenever Beijing um, has an effort to repress Hong Kong, it almost always has the opposite of the intended effect. So that patriotic education effort brought the young generation into activism. Um, so it's, I think that is an example of the sort of thing that should not be tried again. Um, I, I want to mention this as well. Article, you know, uh, Article 23 is another such example. Uh, that's a law against subversion. Subversion is not a concept you have in the common law, which is still, which still um, is in Hong Kong. So I think that's one of the things that the U.S. also must keep a watching brief. And Article 23 would have a devastating effect on press freedom, on religious freedom, on freedom of association, freedom to demonstrate. Um, so I think if the one of the things that we need to do is to make sure there's a sophisticated understanding of what these 
policies are of what's actually happening in Hong Kong. And one reason that legislators might be disqualified is in order to have a majority in the legislature to pass uh, this law, Article 23, which is, which as Mr. Leung said, brought um, uh, tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of people into the street and led to the downfall of C.H. Tung, the former chief executive. So I think it's very important for uh, the U.S. to tell uh, Hong Kong leaders that these misguided policy decisions have real-life consequences, and it's almost always the opposite of what is correct for Hong Kong and China. Thank you. Is there a last question that, uh, briefly, and then we'll wrap up? Yeah, wait, this is the microphone. Uh, would Alan and Alvin think the, um, uh, my name is Cecil Ma from Hong Kong Forum, Los Angeles. Uh, would that trend of manipulation of the democratic system be of something to worry? Uh, first, we had that those protests, those are pro-establishment protests, and then the, 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 the reporters would find busloads of tourists from Shenzhen participating in those, and then you ask them what they're here for, they don't know. <laughs> Wrong answer or something like that. <laughs> and then the more worrying part was that the manipulation is that uh, in an election, uh, you have like the districts would have nine uh, seats and you have 15 parties running or something like that. The pro establishment camp would mobilize just the right amount of voters for each of their uh, favorites. So is that something to worry as in, or will that be f something? bad by 2047 when you have more mainland, uh, mainland uh, immigrants that would be uh, been there for a while. Thank you, Alvin. Of course it is alarming. Um, perhaps I could give the audience a, a very a brief idea of what's really going on here in Hong Kong. We have been having this free election since 98, the uh, first electoral election took place. Um, and there is a representative office of the State Council in Hong Kong. That's called the Central Liaison Office, CLO. And imagine, the Chinese Communist Party has never ever participated in a free election whatsoever, is mastering the skills of campaigning in a free election. Uh, through this uh, tremendous or unlimited amount of resources, they have been mobilizing people by giving out free gifts, uh, organizing free tours or cheap tours around the cities in uh, Guangdong province. And we have to accept the fact that a good number of Hong Kong people find it very, very attractive. And they are most probably uh, not attracted by our uh, ideologies and values. And of course, perhaps um, we do not have sufficient resources to give. And in fact, we do not want to give, give up free gifts. Uh, in any other ordinary days. It's just not our style of holding up liberal democracies. Yet, we have to understand and confess that we are fighting against a very sophisticated uh, 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 opponent in Hong Kong. Uh, but what can we do? Well, I would say this is why Alan and I keep speaking up and we are trying to use with the help of social media to make sure that our next generations do not fall into that sort of uh, campaign style, uh, well, if you call it a campaign style at all. Um, so we would say still at the end of the day is the ideologies, it's the values that prevail, is, is always what's the substance that matters. Um, and this is why we are highly confident in this long fight. Of course, it's not easy. Um, and in fact, with uh, every day they are having 150 immigrants from China going to Hong Kong, it's easy to outnumber us. But then we are there to do a job, we are there to win them over. This is how we are going to demonstrate that one country, two systems is still a, a preferable system. Uh, we are still there to demonstrate that one country, two systems is functioning. So. Uh, it's not easy fight, um, and so Alan will have to still, you know, make sure that he's healthy to, to fight this long fight. 
and I, I want to give uh, Alan the last word. So let me just uh, also remind everyone, if you're not aware, the Hong Kong system is rigged at the outset. So it's not technically, we, it's not something we would recognize as a free election because already the Chinese government can control half the legislature through corporate votes, right? One bank, one vote. Um, if you do business in China, you know which way you have to go. Um, so I, I just want to say that it's already a rigged system, and yet whenever Hong Kong people have a chance to go to the polls, they stand up for values. So I hope they're taking, accepting the free dim sum lunches and then voting for pro-democracy <laughs> candidates. Um, I, I, you know, Hong Kong people are also very pragmatic. Why would you turn down a free but That's how we encourage our supporters <laughs> to do. So, yeah. but, but I think the, the principle is that even within a rigged system, Hong Kong people, whenever they've had a chance to vote, they, they bring their children to, it's a very, you know, go sometime, um, US congressional delegations, please go and observe a vote in Hong Kong. See the parents bring their children. This year, go to the June 4th candlelight mm. memorial. It is the only place in China where the uh, human catastrophe of 1989, Tiananmen Square, can be observed. So those freedoms are very much worth preserving. We know the fight is in Hong Kong, um, but the least we can do is if Hong Kong people are going to make sacrifices, we have the U.S. and all other countries have an, have an obligation to, to recognize and support that fight. So uh, thank you for coming, and, uh, and, and we wish you good luck in the elections as well. Alan, you want to say anything? Uh, yeah. remarks, uh, uh, well, of course, first of all, thank you, Heritage Foundation, again, for having us here uh, this morning. And it has been a very fruitful exchange between uh, the panel and the audience. Uh, the uh, democratic course in Hong Kong uh, is not easy. In fact, it has uh, become more difficult since um, Ms. Warden was with us in Hong Kong, uh, which, which was more than 20 years ago, right? <laughs> Afraid so. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but we are still in very good spirit. I can assure you that, uh, in, the, in fact, the future of the democratic cause lies in whether or not we can win the hearts of the people uh, uh, of Hong Kong. And by winning their hearts, what shall we do? We can only um, hope that they, I mean, Hong Kong people, will appreciate from the bottom of their hearts the importance of uh, the values that uh, uh, we have always shared with liberal democracies of the world. And um, I think it would be naive for anybody in Hong Kong to still think that you can wave the Sino-British Joint Declaration to the face of President Xi, uh, or for that purpose, the basic law, uh, uh, to the face of President Xi and ask him to deliver accordingly. So it is um, really up to us to reposition ourselves uh, and to win more hearts, uh, and uh, I can assure you, as a as a as a as a parting remark, they would we would definitely continue in that uh, fight uh, and to win the hearts of Hong Kong people. Thank well, you. <clears throat> really want to thank you uh, both of you for coming, and uh, Minky for coming from uh, New York. I think as bleak as uh, things may seem, sometimes. Uh, the future of Hong Kong is, I, I, get, I get a lot of hope from hearing uh, people like Alvin and Alan and Martin Lee and Joshua Wong, because uh, you really are fighting the right battle. Uh, and, and you have Minky fighting the war on the, on the, on the <laughs> yes. Manhattan front. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's very important. I want to thank all of you uh, for coming. Take what you heard here today and do, uh, many important people here today, uh, do what you can for this important cause of Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.